read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance Hey, lady listeners, welcome to another week at Read Me Romance. This week, it's me. That's right. You got Leah all to yourself. Are you super excited? I know I am. And as you know, I can talk all by myself for as long as possible. So lock in, guys. And that, that's what the kids are saying these days, by the way, because I mean, I'm assuming that's what the kids are saying, because that's what my daughter tells me all the time. She tells me to lock in. She's like, chat, lock in. So I'm just going to repeat that and try to sound cool and not pretend like I'm, you know, 40 plus years old and I have no idea what I'm saying. Anyways, you're here for the books. I know you're here for all the good stuff. I'm going to tell you everything in just a little bit. We've got Kate Hunt. Um, She has brought us a book called Destined to the Billionaire Cowboy. And if you have never read a Kate Hunt book before you are in for an absolute fucking treat this week. Um, Her books are awesome and tropey and super sexy, insta-love, just over-the-top stuff. She's got tons of books, tons. And that can be read alone. Like, you just, you're about to dive in. So, but before we get into that, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention first. Um, One thing I saw earlier this week that I wanted to talk about was Angelina M. Lopez. And if you guys have been on the podcast for a minute, you know that we have had her on the podcast a couple of times. She is one of my all-time favorites. I love everything she writes. I'm obsessed with it. The way she writes dirty sex scenes is something like I have, I don't know that I've read such good sex that she writes. I it's it's top tier. Top top tier. I cannot state how much I love her writing, especially the dirty stuff. Like her regular writing is awesome, but the dirty stuff is dirty. It's so good. But she has a book that she put out called Give It to Me. And I believe it's 10 stories. I should have looked up how many it was. But it's like an anthology and you can get the paperback or whatever. You can get it signed on her website too. But um, an ebook paperback. But it's it's all these little short stories together. And if you were on the podcast with us previously, she had um, this story called Touch Me. And it was just super, uh, super nasty. Super, super nasty, dirty, delicious, wonderful. Um It was about this girl that was in the library and she ends up fucking this construction worker in the stacks. You know, it's just, it's hot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was so fucking hot. (laughs) But anyways, um, so that came out, uh, this past week. So make sure you grab that if you're a fan of the podcast at all, or, um, if you love Angelina M. Lopez, like I do go check that out. Um, so other than that, uh, I am going to brag a little bit. Like I'm going to drop uh, a, yeah, a heavy brag right now that I got an advanced reader copy of Ruby Dixon's new book, Bull Moon Rising. And I've been reading that. And one thing I got to say about my girl, Rubes, is that it takes a lot to get me to read an ebook. I mean, and you guys know, you know, we're old friends, right? Like you, the listener and me, we're best friends, right? Okay. Bestie, you guys know that I am a 100% audio girl. It is like, I'll read, you know, a hundred and a hundred books a year and 99.9% of them will be audio books. It is rare that I read a single ebook in a year. This bitch sent me an ebook and was like, here. And I have no choice, right? Like as a friend, as you know, it's my duty to the romance community to read this book for, for you guys. So I can tell you how fucking amazing it is. Oh my God, you're going to die. You guys are going to die. I can't wait. I'm trying to see if I can get her to give me an audio clip so I can play it on the podcast. so You guys can listen to it. And think I'm going to try to get her on for an interview. 
So that's the plan right now. Anyways, we'll see. We'll see. I don't want to talk too much about it. You don't want to tell tales out of school. But I will say, if you have not seen the cover of Bull Moon Rising yet by Ruby Dixon, I shit my pants when I saw it. And I'm not even exaggerating. I don't even think I had IBS that day. I think I just was so excited when I saw it, I shit myself. Because it is hot pink, neon, sprayed edges. Like It's like Lisa Frank threw up on this and created the most gorgeous cover I've ever seen. It's so fucking pretty. I just, I can't describe it in any other way that it's just fucking pretty. It's the prettiest, prettiest, prettiest hardback ever. Oh my God. It's going to be so hot to see it in person, which I have not yet. I haven't like held it in my hands, even though I've been friends with this bitch forever. She won't give me one, but I'm just saying anyways, when I eventually get a cover in my hands, I just can't wait. I'm going to have to like put it on a shelf behind me or something. I don't know. I'm going to have to do something with it because it's so fucking pretty. Oh my God. But the story is amazing. And why am I even talking about this now? This is not coming out for another couple of weeks. I don't know. That just, it's on my mind. Okay. I had it on my notes to mention and to hella brag that I got an ARG. So I feel like that was a little privilege that finally, 10 years of friendship paid off and I got an art. So that's play the long game. That's all I suggest to you guys. All right. Play the long game. Um, and also for those of you um, that are on uh, YouTube watching this, I'm going to show you the gift I got for my birthday that Eagle sent me, you know, she's our editor. And if you need an editor, if you're listening to this and you ever need one, she's incredible. But not only is she our editor, she's my best friend. But look at this. It's, and if you're not watching this on YouTube, I'm sorry. It is Edward and Bella from Twilight. And it's on a hair clip. And it's the, you know, if you're a Twilight fan, it's the part in the movie where he has her on the tree. And he tells her, like, hold on, spider monkey. It's that. Yeah. If you've seen Twilight, you know what I'm talking about. So, but instead of him holding on to a tree... He's holding on to like a hair clip and she's on his back so that when you clip this in your hair, it looks like Bella and Edward are clipped into your hair. I posted it on my Instagram. It's Leah Robinson author. If you want to go see it and you can follow me on there too, if you want, but like I posted it on there with a video and photos. I did a whole photo shoot with it, but Eagle is amazing. I love her so much. She was like, she said out, she ordered it. She was like, I ordered it before your birthday, but it didn't come for months. So I finally got in the mail last week and that was my other hard brag. So, I mean, I don't know guys, I'm just living my life right over here. I don't know what's happening right now, but that's what we're doing. So anyways, let's get down to business. You guys want to, um, you know, I could sit here and talk to myself all night. You and I both know we could, but I shouldn't. So let's talk about Destined to the Billionaire Gout Boy by Kate Hunt. Uh, Kate Hunt writes short, sexy, feel-good romances about irresistible men and the curvy heroines they can't live without. Kate is married to her high school sweetheart, unapologetically spoils her pets, and always has a love song stuck in her head. Same girl. Um, today's book you're about to listen to, Destined to the Billionaire Cowboy, is a rich cowboy, a curvy single mom, 20 years of letters and secret longing. Let me tell you, I'll, I'm going to cut in real quick to this to this book bio because I am such a sucker for love letters in a book that, that if people are like pen pals, they write back and forth. I just, oh, that gets me every fucking time. That makes me instantly click. Now back to this. <laughs> I've been in love with my pen pal for longer than I care to admit. But though I've known she's the one for me, I've exercised restraint. I didn't want to risk ruining a good thing. That all changes today. She's coming out to my ranch, and it's time to show her the wild desire that I've kept hidden away. I want her as my wife. I want to give her everything her heart desires. I want us to make babies of our own. Hey! But telling her all of that could very well ruin everything. And if I lose her, my whole world will come crumbling will come crumbling down. He has everything in his life except for her. This Kate Hunt romance is, promises to be a yummy, steamy, years in the making insta love story with a very happily ever after. The cherry on top, you can enjoy each book in the chiseled and curvy series as a standalone. Grab your copy today. 
Destined to the Billionaire Cowboy as part of her Chiseled and Curvy series. There are 10 books in this series, each with a different flavor. Hold on. I'm going to tell you all of them. All 10 books are short, steamy, and can be read as standalones. I looked this up on Amazon earlier because I was like, oh, what are the different ones they have on here? In this series, you can get Obsessive Mountain Man, Billionaire Cowboy, Growly Firefighter, Brutal Bodyguard, Rockstar Next Door, Big Boss, Sweet Hunk, Secret Protector, Boss's Secret, Boss's Big Secret, Summer Manny. Like, there is literally something for every trope. So, if you can dream it, you can get it here. <laughs> so, Kate Hunk's books, Bossy Bread, it comes out um, the day after this episode airs. So, today is, oh my God, what is today? The 24th. So, it comes out tomorrow, the 25th. So, make sure you check that out. That's going to be her brand new release. Um, let's see. It's a no strings attached arrangement that turns into so much more. <laughs> Um, you can find her on social media on Facebook and Instagram under Kate Hunt Romance, H-U-N-T, K-A-T-E, H-U-N-T, Romance. Um, and her fun fact, Kate has written about a hundred books, uh, yeah, a bajillion, um, from super quick 40-page reads to books around a hundred pages. Her favorite things to write about are big, growly, protective men, age gap relationship, lots of baking, and delicious food cute pets, and scenes where the hero is relentless about giving the heroine pleasure. All of Kate Hunt's books always have super happy endings full of babies and love-filled marriages. Ah, those are my favorite. Okay, well, you are about to listen to Destined by the Billionaire Cowboy by Kate Hunt. Um, I'm going to send you in, but I'll see you guys on the other side. Bye! This is Destined to the Billionaire Cowboy. A Chiseled and Curvy Romance by Kate Hunt. Read for you by El Sonali. 1. Andrea I know I shouldn't read his letter again. I've read it so many times already. But when my daughter Sadie goes off to use the bathroom in the back of the diner, I pull Carter's letter out of my purse and soak in his words for the umpteenth time. I can't wait to finally meet you, Andrea. It feels like I've waited my whole life for it. My heart thrums, a mixture of nerves and excitement blooming in my chest. I feel the same way as Carter does. It does feel as if I've waited my whole life to meet him in person, and, to be fair, it's nearly true. We've been writing to each other since fourth grade, ever since we were randomly paired through a national pen pal program. Now, 20 years later, we're about to meet, and it could change everything, for better or worse. Really, Mom? You're reading it again? The sound of my eight-year-old daughter's voice jolts me back into the present moment. I quickly fold up Carter's letter and stuff it into my purse. Sadie laughs as she hops back into the booth across from me. Did you wash your hands? I ask her. Nope. I'm a disgusting human being who uses public bathrooms and doesn't wash her hands. She grabs a french fry from her plate and bites into it. You aren't changing your mind, are you? About what? I ask. Carter? Of course not. I'm excited to meet him. I pause. Are you still okay with it? Yes, Mom. I've told you a billion times. I think it's awesome that you're finally going to meet your pen pal. You should have done this a long time ago. The word pen pal feels far too casual for what I have with Carter. But how else can I describe our relationship? We're not together. He's not my boyfriend. We are just pen pals. That's all it's ever been. As for why it took us this long to meet each other in person, well, I've had my hands full, working a full-time job and raising a kid on my own, and Carter has never suggested that we meet. So it seemed to me that he was fine with keeping our friendship on paper. But a few months ago, 
Sadie and I moved to a new town that's just a few hours away from Carter's ranch. And it felt ridiculous not to meet Carter. So here we are, on our way. We better get going, I say, fishing some money out of my wallet to pay for our meal. Sadie walks with a bounce in her step as we leave the diner and walk back to our car. Her hair is in French braids today, and she's wearing her favorite pink hoodie. She's so much more of a girly girl than I ever was. It's been one of many surprising and fun things about raising her. There's a lot of glitter in our house. Hey, Mom, she says as we pull out of the parking lot and get back on the highway. I'm sure Carter will be a cool guy, but just in case he's not, should we have a code word or something? In case we need to get out of there quickly, I mean? I laugh. Sure, sounds like a good plan. How about cilantro? Ugh, yes, perfect. Sadie wrinkles her little button nose. To her, cilantro tastes soapy and disgusting. I can't say the same applies to me, but I make a point of keeping it out of my cooking for her sake. Your turn to pick the music, I tell my daughter, pressing down on the gas a little more to bring us up to the speed limit. Ooh, I know a really good new K-pop album. Sadie squeals, happily grabbing my phone. A little over an hour later, after miles and miles of peacefully open highway roads, we spot the entrance to Carter's Ranch. There's a large metal gate that would look intimidating if it wasn't open. Our tires rumble over the gravel as I turn off the highway, dust rising behind us in my rearview mirror. All I can see are acres upon acres of land as the gravel road curves and rises up a small hill. It's not until we reach the top that the rest of the ranch comes into view. Oh, wow, breathes Sadie. Look how big this place is. I'm at a loss for words. The ranch seems to reach all the way into the horizon with a backdrop of the majestic mountains off in the distance. There are softly rolling hills, lots of huge trees, and a glimmering lake. An enormous house sits straight ahead of us on one of the hills, and cattle are grazing in the pastures. I swallow, feeling a little disoriented. This can't be Carter's ranch. I must have turned into the wrong place. Surely I would have known if Carter's property was this massive, this luxurious. I slow the car down as we reach the wide circular driveway in front of the main house. I'm prepared to drive all the way around and head out the way we came in. But then, I spot a figure in the distance out in the field. A man is riding a horse coming directly toward us at a steady clip. Carter. I can feel it in my whole body. There's not an ounce of doubt in me. I press my foot harder on the brake, easing the car to a full stop. But then I'm just left sitting there frozen still as I stare at Carter riding the horse toward us. Uh, Mom? Sadie asks. Are you okay? I nod, take a breath, turn off the car's engine, then, with a slight shake in my hands, I unclick my seatbelt and get out of the car. I hear Sadie get out of the passenger side as the rhythmic thuds of the horse's hooves grow louder. At the edge of the field, Carter effortlessly dismounts his horse and starts to walk over. He tips off his cowboy hat as he comes near. Tousled brown hair frames his face, and his jaw is covered in a scruffy beard. The closer he comes, the taller and broader he seems. I'm still speechless as he wraps me in a hug, a gorgeously earthy, leathery sun-kissed scent enveloping me in the process. To be embraced by this man after all these years feels nothing short of miraculous. Hi, Carter, I managed to whisper against his ear. Can't believe you're finally here, 
he murmurs, holding me tight. Two, Carter. I'm going to marry this woman. I've wanted it for years, but now that I've finally gotten to meet her in person, I know as much as I've known anything that it's not just a fantasy built up in this big old dreamy head of mine. She's the singular love of my life, and if I can't make her my wife, I'm not going to bother trying with anyone else. I know it must seem crazy that I've kept myself away from her for so long, but I didn't want to risk ruining what we have. This friendship has been everything to me, my primary source of happiness. She's my rock, my inspiration, my confidant. I couldn't risk losing all of that. But now she's here, and it's time that I finally tell her how I feel. I could keep holding Andrea like this for hours. It feels so good. God damn, does it feel good. All those hundreds of letters we've written to each other over the years sure did a number on my heart, but they didn't prepare me for how I'd feel in this moment. It feels like pure magic. Guess it would be a bit much if I dropped down on one knee right here and now, huh? Reluctantly, I release my arms from around Andrea. When I look down at her face, I'm overwhelmed all over again by her beauty. She has the most jewel-like green eyes and gorgeously round, full cheeks. Her curves are something else, too. Christ, she's bigger and more curvy than I expected, and I love it. Andrea's daughter clears her throat, and I regain my composure turning my attention to the eight-year-old standing a few feet away. I stick out a hand toward her in greeting. I'm Sadie, she says confidently, her shoulders pushed back and her chin tilted up. Nice to meet you, young lady, I say, shaking her hand. How was the drive? Long, she says, flashing me a look of disapproval as if the distance was my fault. I chuckle. I apologize for living out in the middle of nowhere. How big is this place? Sadie asks, looking around. Sadie, Andrea says. Then she smiles quickly at me. It's a very beautiful property. I nod my thanks. I feel lucky to take care of it. I'll give you both a tour later. In my periphery, I see George coming over. Andrea, Sadie, let me introduce you to George, my right-hand man. He'll be taking your things inside. Please feel free to follow him into the house. I need to see to my horse, and then I'll join you ladies. A hesitant expression passes over Andrea's face before she nods and smiles at me. Okay, we'll see you inside. Usually, I take my time with everything I do especially when it comes to tending to the animals on my ranch. But today I make haste of the usual routine. I quickly ride Copper back to the barn, get her unsaddled, and make sure she has ample hay and water before giving her a loving pat on the neck and swiftly making my way over to the house. Entering my mudroom, I catch my reflection in the mirror on the wall and see how filthy I am from this morning's duties around the ranch. Dust and dirt clings to my shirt and weathered jeans, and the bandana around my neck is damp with sweat. I can't spend my first hours with Andrea and her daughter like this. After hanging my hat on its usual hook, I make my way further into the house and duck into the nearest bathroom. It's always felt excessive to have as many bathrooms as I do in this house, but right now I'm grateful that there's one so easily accessible to me. As I shuck off my soiled clothes, I use the intercom to ask George if he could please bring me some fresh clothes. Of course, sir, he answers. Any preference in terms of style? Nah, I trust you, George, I say. Then I take the world's most efficient shower. Steam hardly gets a chance to form in the air before I'm done, I'm drying myself off with a towel when I hear footsteps coming toward the bathroom door. 
eager to get changed. I opened the door, saying, Thank you, George, I appreciate... But it's not George. It's Andrea, wide-eyed and surprised at my sudden appearance. Oh, she says, I'm sorry, I was just... That's when I feel the towel slip. My reflexes kick in, but they aren't fast enough to catch the towel before it falls open, exposing every last inch of myself. Andrea claps a hand over her mouth and quickly spins around. I'm going to, um, I'll leave you be, she says, flustered. I curse under my breath as she rushes away, wrapping the towel around my waist again. A second later, when George comes around the corner with a neatly folded stack of clothes in hand, he gives me a concerned, curious look. Everything all right, sir? He asks. I sigh and shake my head in dismay. I'll have to get back to you on that, George. Three, Andrea. Stop picturing it, stop picturing it, stop picturing it. That's what I'm telling myself as I stumble in a daze back to the kitchen, where my daughter is perched on a bar stool with her feet tucked up under her as she reaches toward the decadent spread of snacks set out on the kitchen island. The sight of her is a reminder that I can't let myself get swept away by the attraction I feel toward Carter. I need to keep my wits about me. Every decision I make ultimately affects her, too. Aren't you going to eat any of this, Mom? Sadie asks, popping a juicy red grape off its vine. That's all right, I say. I'm not hungry. He got your favorite thing, though. Sadie points to a carved wooden bowl full of trail mix. I smile at the sight of it. I have a hopeless addiction to trail mix, and I can see that the type sitting on the kitchen island even has wasabi peas in it, which is my absolute favorite variety. But I'm too bewildered to have an appetite. It's not just from seeing Carter naked. I mean, that's a big part of it. Jesus, his body... Those big shoulders, those defined abs, that sexy V-line, and that thick cock. A man shouldn't be that hot. It's criminal. But even before getting an eyeful of his flawless physique, I was in a state. This ranch of his is insane. This house is insane. Carter is clearly a very wealthy man, and the fact that I had no idea that he was living this kind of life makes me feel, well, a lot of things. But mostly confused about why he never told me, and insecure about my own modest life. For the past several years, I've quietly fallen in love with Carter. The letters we exchange are one of the most cherished things in my life. Although we planned this visit under the pretense of us being lifelong friends who were finally going to meet in person, I secretly hoped that it would lead to something more. Now, that feels like a childish fantasy. How could I ever fit into a life like this? The firm stride of boots coming into the room pulls my attention toward the sound. I look up and see Carter enter the kitchen with a relaxed gait, He's fully dressed now, wearing a well-fitted denim shirt that clings to his muscular arms, jeans with an engraved belt buckle, and sturdy cowboy boots. A large watch with a leather band wraps around his left wrist. Somehow he's just as attractive in clothes as he is when he's not wearing a stitch. Can I get you anything else, ladies? Carter asks his lips turning up into a handsome smile as he joins us. The funny thing is, I've often felt that smile in the words that he writes to me, but seeing it in person has a whole other effect on me, unleashing a flurry of butterflies in my stomach. This is more than enough, I say, glancing at the luxurious spread on the kitchen island. I hope you didn't go through too much trouble for our visit. No, it's wonderful to have guests, Carter says. I don't have them very often. 
Really? says Sadie curiously as she helps herself to a cracker. But your branch is so big. Sadie, I say quickly, but Carter just laughs. That's a good point, Sadie, he says. This is an awful lot of land and house for one person. I'll be the first to admit that I've been a bit excessive in that regard. How many horses do you have? Sadie asks. Two, Carter says. Their names are Copper and Sunset. We can saddle up if you'd like, Sadie. What do you say? Are you up for a tour of the ranch on horseback? Sadie's eyes light up. Really? Of course, as long as your mom's up for it. Sadie looks at me with pleading eyes. Can we, Mom? I've never ridden a horse, I say. That feeling of inadequacy pulsing in me again. We'll take it slow, Carter says, giving me a panty melting smile. I promise there won't be any galloping involved. When we get to the barn, Carter saddles up the horses and goes over some basics. When he offers to take Sadie on his horse, I'm torn between feeling overprotective of my daughter and grateful that he's making an effort to get to know her. Since I'm not confident in how I'm going to handle my own horse, I encourage Sadie to ride with Carter, and she happily mounts his horse. With Carter and Sadie riding Copper and me riding Sunset, we start off from the barn. The horses seem to know where to take us without needing any guidance, staying side by side as we meander across the open pasture. Meanwhile, Carter speaks with laid-back ease about the land we're getting a tour of. It's nice to hear him talk about it. It's obvious he knows every square inch of this land and that it's not just real estate to him. The way he speaks about the land conveys how appreciative he is to have ownership of this domain. And yet, I'm still struggling to reconcile how different our lives are. He owns all of this gorgeous land, while I'm living paycheck to paycheck, and am only able to afford a small apartment. Sadie and I have certainly made it our own, but that doesn't change the fact that it's barely big enough for the two of us. The only bit of green in our apartment is the potted basil plant on our kitchen windowsill. Can we ride down to the lake, Carter? Sadie asks hopefully. Absolutely, Carter says, then clicks his tongue. The horses obey his command and we make our way down to the shimmering lake. Once there, Carter dismounts from his horse, then helps Sadie down. While she runs off toward the lake's edge, where some ducks are swimming, Carter extends a hand for me to take. Thank you, I say, accepting his help as I dismount sunset. I try my best to be graceful about it, but as I'm dismounting, my foot catches on the saddle and suddenly I'm tumbling into Carter's strong arms. Whoa, you okay? He asks, his thick eyebrows knitting together as he steadies me. I'm fine. I say quickly. His arms are still protectively wrapped around me, and my heart is racing from the embrace. I swear I can feel his chiseled abs through his shirt. Calm down, I silently beg myself. For Pete's sake, he was just looking out for you. Carter holds on to me for a second longer, then slowly drops his arms away. His eyes focus intently on mine as he looks down at me. Hey, sorry about earlier, he says. That wasn't intentional. My neck flushes as the vivid memory of his naked body flashes in my mind. Don't worry about it, I say. Really? He says. I'm mortified about it, Andrea. Is he? He certainly doesn't seem embarrassed. It's really not a big deal, I say, wishing this conversation would end. Carter crooks an eyebrow. No? I mean, it's not like I see that kind of thing every day, but I cut myself off. I'm just making this worse. It's not a big deal. Let's just forget it happened. 
All right, he says. Deal. Then he smiles. Aside from seeing me naked, how are you feeling about this? Does it feel weird, good, bad? In our letters, Carter and I have always been emotionally candid with each other. I've expressed many thoughts and feelings to him that I've never shared with anyone else. Fears, worries, longings, regrets, joys. But right now, I suddenly understand how much easier it is to be vulnerable with someone through a letter. It's so different in person. I'm overwhelmed, I tell him. Carter nods. Yeah, same. What is he overwhelmed by? Is he just saying that to make me feel better? A shriek cuts into our conversation, my attention immediately flying over to Sadie. She's running toward us, panic on her face. It's chasing me, she cries. It's then that I see the duck running after her. I gasp, but then Carter bursts out laughing, and immediately the mood of the moment lightens. Bella, leave our guests alone, Carter bellows at the duck. The duck stops, lets out a quack, and then turns and waddles back to the lake. Four, Carter. I can picture it so easily. Our future life together, I mean. Before it was a vague and hopeful fantasy. But ever since Andrea and Sadie arrived, it's become a clearer and clearer vision in my mind. I can easily imagine what it will be like for the two of them to live here on the ranch with me. I can imagine waking up every day next to Andrea, eating meals together as a family of three, decorating a Christmas tree together during the holidays. Shit. I can even imagine what one of the spare bedrooms would look like converted into a nursery. I wonder how many babies we'll have together. Many, I hope. I peer over the top of the playing cards I'm holding, stealing a glance across the table at Andrea. She's concentrating on the cards in her own hand, trying to decide which ones to pass to Sadie. This is our third round of playing hearts, it's been a nice way to spend the evening, especially after the hearty dinner we had. But I'm also looking forward to getting some one-on-one -on -one time with Andrea soon. Does the idea of opening up and finally telling her everything scare me? Hell yeah, of course it does. But I'm going to do it anyway. Letting her go home without hearing the whole truth isn't even an option. All right, here you go, Sadie, says Andrea, passing three cards to her daughter. Then Sadie passes three cards to me. When I see the cards she's passed to me, three high hearts, I can't help but shoot her a dismal look. Sadie giggles, covering her mouth with her cards. Twenty minutes later, Sadie is celebrating a well-earned win. I shake my head impressed at how quickly she picked up the strategies that she did. You've got a smart one here, you know that? I say to Andrea as I give the cards a thorough shuffle. Andrea smiles and reaches out to smooth Sadie's hair. Did you have fun today, sweetie? Sadie nods and lets out a big yawn. Okay, I think it's time to get you into bed, Andrea says. But I want to play more, Sadie protests. There will be plenty of time for that tomorrow, I promise. Sadie sighs. Okay, are you going to bed too, Mom? Not quite, but I won't be up that much longer. Sadie nods, then slides out of her chair and comes over to give me an unexpected hug. Good night, Carter. Good night, Sadie, I say. Sweet dreams. Andrea tells me she'll be back soon and takes her daughter's hand as she goes off to put her to bed. While they're gone, I clear off the table and then go out to the patio to get the fire pit going. As the flames grow and lap at the night air, I reposition my two Adirondack chairs a little closer together.
I'm back inside, pouring wine into two glasses, when Andrea comes into the kitchen. Is that bedroom all right for her? I ask. It's more than all right. It's a dream bedroom for her. She loves the canopy bed and all the pink. Andrea accepts the wine glass I offer her, and we take our drinks outside. As I watch her wide hips slide into the Adirondack chair beside mine, I feel a fresh surge of desire. I wish she'd come over here and slide onto my lap and let me savor those incredible curves. Then she asks me the question I knew was coming. Carter, why didn't you tell me your life was like this? Guilt gnaws at me. I didn't know how to tell you without it sounding like I was bragging. I'm sorry. Are you upset? No. Confused, yes. But not upset. I imagined you and your life to be a certain way, and it's so much different than what I expected. She pauses thoughtfully. I'm happy for you, though. It's amazing that you've done so well for yourself. I've been lucky, I say. No, it's a lot more than luck, Carter. I know how hard you work. You're the hardest working cattle rancher in the world. Maybe too hard of a worker, I admit. I don't do much else. I want to tell her that I'll make plenty of time for her and Sadie if they come to live here with me, but I know that's jumping the gun. I don't even know if she has any sort of feelings about me beyond platonic ones. Fuck, just the thought of her rejecting me sends a sharp pain to my gut. I look up into the sky above us. The stars are bright tonight. There's the Big Dipper, I say. Oh, she says, awe in her voice as she gazes upward. Well, I've never seen the sky look like that. We should have come out here before Sadie went to bed. She loves looking for constellations. I look at Andrea admiringly, thinking about how good of a mom she is. I know it's been tough for her, raising a kid on her own. Sadie's dad hasn't ever been in the picture. Andrea never had an actual relationship with him, so she's truly had to do it all herself. I'm seriously in awe of this woman. You're amazing. You know that? I say. Andrea's eyes meet mine. What? You're amazing, Andrea. I'm so in awe of you. Even in the warm glow of the firelight, I can see her cheeks turn rosy. What are you talking about? You're such a good mother, I say, and such a good person. Such a beautiful person. She chews on her lip. I can tell she's overwhelmed by everything I'm saying. I stand up out of my chair, take a step toward her, and hold out my hand. She looks at it nervously then takes it. As I pull her up, she inhales a little surprised breath. As I start to lead us in a lazy slow dance, turning us in a slow circle as we sway, she rests her head against my chest. I've wanted you for so long. I whisper against the top of her head. She lifts her head, looking up at me in surprise. You have? I nod. For years. I... She's suddenly a little breathless. But I'm... You're what, Andrea? I'm not... I can't. She furrows her brows. Why me? Why not you? I ask. She hesitates for a moment, then says, I just feel like someone else would be better suited to the kind of life you have. You mean someone more outdoorsy? I ask, smiling. No. Her eyes drop from mine. Someone used to all this luxury. Well, darling, that's not how I feel, I say. I use a finger to tip her chin up. As I slowly dip my head down toward hers, her lips part ever so slightly in surprise. 
and I'm pressing a long overdue kiss to her lush lips. Five, Andrea. The next morning, Carter wakes us early, telling us that he has a surprise waiting. As he cooks us a breakfast of eggs, sausage, hash browns, and biscuits, Sadie eagerly guesses what the surprise might be. Carter has fun teasing her, saying maybe in response to too many of her guesses. I'm still processing the fact that Carter kissed me last night. That was all it ended up being, a single kiss. But my world feels rocked by it. I know I was secretly hoping for something like this to happen between us, but I guess I didn't believe it would happen for real. But the kiss he gave me last night was the most real thing I've ever felt. It scares me a little how much more I want from him. It took me forever to fall asleep last night because I couldn't stop thinking about what it would be like to be ravished by him, to be pinned down on the bed by him, to feel his hard muscles against my curves, to be plunged into and filled up and claimed, oh God, I can't be thinking about that right now. I take another bite of my breakfast, forcing myself to focus on how delicious it is. I was a little surprised to walk into the kitchen this morning and find Carter standing at the stove, since he has hired staff. But it turns out that he likes to cook. Everything he made is cooked to perfection, especially the buttery, flaky biscuits. All done! Sadie declares, wiping a napkin over her lips. Can we go see the surprise now? Whoa, cowgirl, Carter says. Your mom and I have to finish eating first. Sadie sighs. I give her a look to remind her that we're Carter's guests, and she grabs her plate and brings it over to the kitchen sink. After breakfast, we get changed, then go outside with Carter. He takes us on a walk across his property, not giving away any clues as we make the trek. But as soon as we crest one of the hills, the surprise is revealed. A little ways further on, there's a giant hot air balloon waiting for us. No way, says Sadie with a gasp. I gape at the hot air balloon, then look at Carter. Carter, you didn't need to do something like this for us. Remember when we were talking about the hot air balloon festival in Albuquerque? He says, referring to some of our old letters. Well, one of these years, I'll take us to it. But in the meantime, I thought you'd enjoy a hot air balloon of your own. That's really sweet of you, I say feeling a little emotion in my throat. It doesn't feel like I deserve all of this attentiveness. As we approach the balloon, a pilot greets us and explains a few things about how the balloon works before helping us get into the basket. I wrap my arms around my daughter as we lift off. It's a smooth ascent as we climb up into the air, and aside from the blasts of hot air from the burner, it's serenely quiet. Soon, we're floating high above Carter's ranch, and the view of his property takes my breath away. The trees and all the cattle become miniaturized. The shimmering lake that we visited yesterday turns into a little puddle on the ground. And as we drift higher still, I see how Carter's ranch is part of the greater whole. I look over at him studying his ruggedly handsome face as he looks out admiringly at the view. Are those tears in his eyes? Is this your first time doing this too, Carter? I ask him. He blinks away the dampness in his eyes and smiles as he looks at me. Yep, sure is. I've thought about doing it before, but I wanted to wait for you. We stay in the air for about an hour and slowly make our descent. It's a gentle landing, and as I'm climbing out of the basket, I thank our pilot for such a wonderful experience. It was my pleasure, he says. Enjoy the rest of your day, folks. 
and he looks down at Sadie, gives her a big smile and says, quite a treat from mom and dad, wasn't it? My heart hiccups at the innocent mistake. Sadie glances at me and smiles at the pilot. Yes, she says, it really was. I had so much fun. The three of us begin to make our way back toward the house. Once we're out of earshot from the pilot, Sadie grins at Carter and says, So, what are we going to do now, Dad? My heart hiccups again. I open my mouth to try to nip this in the bud before it becomes uncomfortable, but Carter speaks before I'm able to. Well, since you asked, kiddo, he says, I think you better do some chores now. Oh, no. Sadie groans. I'm relieved that Carter is taking it in stride and joking around with her, but I'm still worried that joking about him being her dad could make him feel uncomfortable. To change the subject, I clear my throat and say, Hey, Sadie, why don't you tell Carter about the play you're rehearsing in school? And, as I knew it would, that prompts my daughter to launch into a long and vivid explanation. Six. Carter. I know Sadie was only joking when she called me dad, but the reality is, I liked it. It felt comfortable, her calling me that. If all of this works out how I hope it will, I'm going to raise that little girl as if she's always been my own. After the exhilaration of the hot air balloon ride this morning, the three of us have been enjoying some leisure time at the house. It's rare for me to kick back like this, and it's difficult for me to not think about work. But I trust my ranch hands to keep things under control while I'm spending this time away from my usual duties. They're always telling me I work too much anyway. Right now, I'm showing Sadie how I polish my boots. Meanwhile, Andrea is sitting on the couch a few feet away, cozied up under an heirloom quilt as she watches us. Every time I glance over at her, our eyes catch, and something fierce courses through me. I can't stop picturing her with a ring on her finger and a big, beautiful pregnant belly. Mom, can I have some cowboy boots for my birthday? Sadie asks, looking over her shoulder. Instead of the rollerblades you've been wanting, you mean? Andrea asks. Sadie's lips twist as she thinks it over. Do I have to pick? A beat passes before Andrea answers. Well, let's talk about it later, sweetie. Can Andrea not afford to buy her daughter both things? Or is this more of an issue of not wanting to spoil her? I hope it's the latter, but if that's the case, I wonder if I've been spoiling Sadie too much. Fuck, I didn't even think about that. My mind is going over the other activities I have planned for the next few days when my phone buzzes in my pocket. I dig it out and see that my ranch foreman is calling and answer the call. Boss, we've got a problem, he says. He proceeds to tell me about the wolves. I'm instantly on my feet, all the muscles in my body tense. I quickly wrap up the call, then say to Andrea, I've got to go. I've got a stampede on my hands. Andrea's eyes go wide. She pushes the quilt off her lap and stands up too. Oh no, is there anything I can do to help? No, stay here. Please be safe, Carter. I step toward her and plant a quick kiss on her forehead. Don't worry, I'll be fine. 7. Andrea I can't stop worrying about him. I know he's dealt with stampedes before, and he knows what he's doing. But when he told me about those previous stampedes, I learned about them after the fact in one of his letters, and I knew he was safe. It's completely different this time. Is he going to be okay? Sadie asks, looking at me with worried eyes. I'm sure he will be, sweetie, I say, trying to reassure myself as much as I'm reassuring her. He's been doing this for a long time. I look around, 
searching for something that we can distract ourselves with while we wait. There's a large television mounted on the wall, but when I search around for a remote, I can't find one anywhere. My eyes drift over to his bookshelves next, but right now I feel too jittery to read. God, my stomach hurts. I'm worrying myself sick. Wincing, I grab my phone and hand it to Sadie. You can watch something on it, I tell her. I'll be back in a few minutes, okay? Sadie nods, looking at me with anxiousness as she accepts the phone. I wince again as I make my way out of the living room and down the hallway to the nearest bathroom. There, I lean against the edge of the sink and concentrate on taking several slow, long breaths. That helps with the pain in my stomach, but it doesn't fully alleviate my worry. I can't stop imagining unruly cattle charging at Carter. He'll be fine, I tell myself. He can handle it. He's a capable man. He'll be fine. After another few minutes, I open the door of the bathroom and start to head back toward the living room. But along the way, my eye catches Carter's open office door. And then I find myself walking into his office because... It feels so much like him, and right now I need as much of him as I can get. I sit down in the leather chair behind his desk, my heart tugging as I get a whiff of his masculine scent. His desk is covered in various papers, all of which look related to his business. There's also an old table lamp and a cup full of pens. And then my eyes land on it a carved wooden box sitting on the corner of the desk. The lid isn't pushed down all the way, and a sliver of cream-colored paper is peeking out. I recognize that cream-colored paper immediately. It's one of my letters to him. Curious if the box is full of what I think it is, I reach out and remove the lid. Yep. This box is completely packed full of all the letters I've sent him over the years. Emotion builds in my chest as I see the handwritten pages. I've saved all of the letters he sent me too, but I never assumed that he had done the same. I wonder if he ever rereads them like I do. I'm about to put the lid back in place when a folded piece of paper falls out from the inside of the lid. Frowning, I tilt my head to look at the mysterious page. Dear Andrea, it reads, I can't hold this in any longer. I'm in love with you. To be honest, I've been madly in love with you for years. I've wanted to tell you so many times, but I always end up talking myself out of it because I haven't wanted to risk losing you. There's nothing after that. It's an unfinished, unsent letter, but that doesn't make his words feel any less real. With a thundering heart, I tuck the paper back into place, set the lid back on the box, and hurry out of the room. 8. Carter The thunder of hooves and clouds of dust congest the air around me, as I ride my horse through the stampeding cattle. I'm trying to break up the herd, but it's proving to be harder than it should be. Damn it, those wolves really riled up my cattle. I look over in the direction of some of my ranch hands. They're putting up makeshift barriers to try to contain the stampede. The men are working efficiently, doing all that they can to maintain order among the chaos, but it might not be enough. Wait. Is that Andrea? Jesus Christ, what is she doing out here? Alarm and protectiveness flares in my chest. I nudge my heels against my horse's sides and lean forward, prompting Copper into a gallop. As we fly toward Andrea, she doesn't even look up, remaining focused on the fencing she's helping get in place. I tighten my grip on the reins and command Copper to stop right by Andrea's side. What are you doing out here? I demand. Andrea throws a quick glance in my direction. Helping out. It isn't safe. You need to get back to the house. I can handle it, Carter. 
She grimaces as she lifts one end of another fence section. Hoofbeats rumble nearby. My hands tense around the reins. It isn't safe, I repeat. I'm getting you out of here. She ignores my objection and continues to work. Andrea! I bark, frustrated and impatient. But then I hear the shouts of my men over on the other side of the pasture, and I look up to see that the herd has scattered, and the scene is even more chaotic now. I don't have time to get Andrea to safety. I need to get a handle on my cattle, and I need to do it now. Afterward, when everything is finally under control, I ride Copper back over to where Andrea is helping my men take down the fencing they had temporarily put up. Without saying a word, I jump off my horse and stride over to Andrea. She yelps when I take her by the arm, and when I grab her and hoist her up onto my horse, she shoots me a fiery look. What are you doing? She protests. I mount my horse, brusquely pull Andrea's arms around my waist, and prompt Copper back into a gallop. At the speed we're going, Andrea is forced to hold on tight. I relish the feeling of her arms around me like this, but I can't focus on that right now. We fly across the pastures, not stopping until we've reached the closest building where I can speak to her in private. The wine cellar, a rustic building made of stone. Andrea tries to wriggle her hand out of my grip as I pull her inside, but I don't release her wrist until I've got the door shut behind us. You can't do shit like that, I say angrily. I told you to stay in the house. Andrea stares at me indignantly. You're seriously mad at me for helping you? You put yourself in danger, Andrea. You have zero experience on a ranch. If anything had happened to you... I stop and blow out a deep, hard breath. I'd never forgive myself. Do you understand? Her expression softens a little. Yes, I get where you're coming from. But, Carter, I couldn't just sit in the house doing nothing while you were out here dealing with an emergency. I had to do something. I had to be useful, otherwise... Otherwise what? I mean, if I don't have anything to contribute... She says, what's the point? I shake my head. What are you talking about? You already do so much for me, honey. You're the best friend anyone could ever ask for. Is that really enough? It's more than enough. Her eyes grow damp. Oh, Carter, I was so scared. I step forward and wrap my arms around her, tucking her soft curves against my chest. I'm sorry, baby. I should have reassured you more before I left. She nods and exhales a gentle breath. Then she looks up at me. Will you teach me things? I smile a little. What kind of things? About the ranch. I want to know how everything works. Even if you don't need me to help out, I want to be able to. I want to be involved. My smile grows. I'll show you everything you want to know. Does that mean you're going to be sticking around? She bites her lip, some shyness coming into her face. If you want me to. I found the letter you never sent me, Carter. Is that how you still feel? Or did you not send it because your feelings changed? It's how I feel, I say, knowing exactly what letter she's talking about. I'm desperately in love with you. I'm in love with you, too, she whispers. Oh, God, Carter, I've wanted you so much this whole time. I've never heard more perfect words. Relief floods through me, allowing me to say what I've wanted to say for so long. I want to marry you, honey, I tell her. I want to make a life with you and make babies with you as many as possible. Carter. She whimpers. I capture her lips with an impassioned kiss, pushing her up against the smooth stones on the wall. 
Andrea's hands grip my shirt, clenching the fabric tightly as our kiss deepens. I press against her, groaning, as I feel her curves welcome me. My cock is rock hard and nearly busting out of my jeans. I drag a hand over her generous hip, then wrench her toward me, pulling her tightly against my heart on. See what you do to me, I growl. She wets her lips and looks up at me with rosy cheeks. Take care of me, Carter. I'm yours. Her words drive me into action. I tear open the button on her pants and tug them roughly down her hips. Underneath, she has on a lacy pair of panties that are already visibly soaked. Fuck, sweetheart, I mutter, dragging my big fingertips over her damp panties. I was going to eat you out first to get you nice and ready for my cock, but you're already dripping wet. My girl whimpers as my fingers keep stroking her. She pushes her hips forward and says, Please, Carter, it hurts. You're aching that bad, huh, darling? She nods needfully. I dip my head and kiss her neck. Good, because so am I. I get my jeans undone, letting them drop down and crumple around my boots. Fisting my cock, I groan at how hard I am. I drag the head of my cock over Andrea's soaked panties, drawing a desperate moan from her lips, and then tug the fabric to the side and push my bare cock against her slit. Blood rushes through my veins as I sink into her, every muscle in my body burning hot. I go slow but deep, her pussy tight around me as I stretch her out and stuff her full. We breathe together as I fuck her like that, keeping her pinned up against the wall as I slowly piston in and out of her. My cock is coated in her juices, and I can feel her pleasure as much as I can feel my own. Nothing has ever felt as good as this. Nothing has even come close. Tell me you're going to marry me, darling. I choke out when I'm deep inside her. Tell me you'll be my wife. Andrea moans. You can't ask me that when you're inside me, Carter. Fine. I thrust into her again, harder this time. I'll ask you again later. I'll make it real romantic. But at least tell me you're going to say yes. Of course I'm going to say yes. I struggle to get my next question out because... The pleasure radiating through me is so damn intense. Are you going to make me wait to put a baby in you too? Andrea moans again. No, do it now. You sure, darling? I'm sure. Come inside me, she begs. Please, fill me up. I pump into her harder, giving it to her raw and rough, my thighs burn as I drive into her hot, velvety cunt. I'm right on the edge, so close to exploding, but I restrain myself until I can feel her right there with me. I'm coming, Andrea cries. Oh God, I'm coming. Our mouths crush together as I slam into her. I explode inside her, filling her womb as her pussy milks my cock. And in the clarity of that moment, I know that this is exactly how things were supposed to be with us. Two decades of letters, and then a lifetime of bliss. Epilogue, Andrea, three years later. Mom! Sadie yells from her bedroom. I need to go into town and get more stamps! I smile at Tanner, my two-year-old, as I finish doing up the buttons on his top. Tanner gives me a drool-laden smile in return, and I laugh and wipe a thumb across his lips. Then I hoist my son into my arms and carry him on my hip as I walk across the hallway to my daughter's bedroom. Sadie is sitting at her desk, 
a sealed pink envelope sitting in front of her. I don't have to peek at the address to know that it's a letter to her pen pal, Griffin. The two of them were paired up through a school program, just like Carter and I were all those years ago. Sadie insists that she absolutely does not have a crush on Griffin, but I must say she gets extremely giddy any time one of his letters arrives in the mail. Really, sweetie? I say amused. You're out of stamps already? Sadie gives me a devastated nod, her dangly earrings swaying back and forth. At 11, she's a whole lot taller and more grown up than she was at age 8. But even though she's a ranch girl now, she still loves everything glittery and pink. I rub a hand over my baby bump, wondering how much our baby girl is going to be like Sadie. Okay, I say. Well, when your dad gets in, you can ask him if he has time to take you into. That's him! Sadie exclaims, jumping up and rushing out of her bedroom. I follow her at a slower pace. By the time I catch up to her, she's in the mudroom begging her dad to take her into town. Do we have time for that today? Carter asks, checking his watch. Dad, please! Sadie begs. I really, really want to get this letter in the mail today. Must be something awfully important in it, he muses. Sadie's cheeks go a little pink. I just want to get it mailed, that's all. Carter chuckles and grabs his hat from where he just set it on its hook. All right, cowgirl. If you saddle up copper, we can ride her into town. Thanks, Dad! Sadie exclaims and rushes to get her boots on. Before they leave, Carter pulls me in by the waist to give me a kiss. How are you feeling, darling? Great, I say. With his son in my arms and another one of his babies in my womb, I've never been happier. Good, Carter says. I promise we won't be gone long. My husband makes good on his promise. He and Sadie are back before I know it. As Carter whips up one of his delicious family dinners for us, Sadie tells me all about their ride into town. Do you think I could get my own horse for my birthday this year? Sadie asks suddenly. Carter and I exchange a quick look. Uh, we'll have to talk about that, kiddo, Carter says. Okay, fine, says Sadie, letting out a light sigh. But whatever disappointment she may be feeling in that moment seems to evaporate as she takes her little brother into her arms and starts playing and laughing with him. As I watch Sadie and Tanner interact, my heart swells with love and gratitude for the family that I have. Even if we were to lose everything, I know we would be okay, because we have each other. By the time we get the kids in bed, I'm exhausted. I go upstairs to our bedroom and flop down on the bed, letting out a big yawn. With my eyes shut, I lay there for a while, savoring the softness of our bed. The sound of Carter's slow, heavy footsteps drifts into my awareness. I keep my eyes closed, but smile as I hear him come over and then feel him lean over me and press a warm kiss to my forehead. Can I give you a massage? He asks, his low voice vibrating through me. I would love that, I whisper. I moan as his hands rub up and down my shoulders, massage my neck, and work their way down my curves to my swollen feet. Those big, sturdy hands of his always know exactly how to touch me and make me feel deeply loved. He's still rubbing my feet when I open my eyes and look down at him, where he's crouching at the end of the bed. Stand up, Carter, I say softly. I'm not done, he says, still concentrating on my feet. Carter, I repeat, stand up. As he does, I sit up and scoot forward. I hear his breathing deepen as I undo his fly and pull out his thick, hard cock. Fuck. Carter groans as I take him into my mouth. His cock pulses as I take him as deep as I can. I reach up 
and rub his balls while I blow him, moaning at the pleasure it gives me to suck my husband's cock. I'm desperately hungry for his cum, but Carter pulls out of my mouth before he gets too close. I pout, but he shakes my head and pulls me up onto my feet. He tugs off all of our clothes and then gets me back on the bed, positioning me on all fours. I release a moan as Carter penetrates me from behind, his rigid cock sliding deeply into my pussy. My hands clench the bed covers as he holds onto my hips and thrusts into me with hard, relentless pumps. I always get off quickly when he claims me like this, and tonight is no exception. Within minutes, I'm muffling a scream into the sheets as my pussy pulses around his cock. Carter is still deep inside me as he joins me on the warm bed, spooning me from behind as he gets us lying on our sides. He starts fucking me again, but slower this time, each stroke perfectly luxurious. I look over my shoulder at him, and he captures my lips. With one arm wrapped around me, he brings his other hand to caress my pregnant belly, as he drives into me. I love you, sweetheart. He rasps. I love you too, I say breathlessly. So, so much. Another orgasm rushes up inside me, and I cry out into our kiss as I come. Then I feel a powerful rush of warmth as Carter fills me with his seed. No matter how many times we make love, it never loses its magic. Our life never loses its magic. And I know that's because he's my soulmate, my one and only, my destiny. This has been Destined to the Billionaire Cowboy, a chiseled and curvy romance by Kate Hunt, read for you by El Sonali. Welcome back, lady listeners. I hope you love listening to Destined to the Billionaire Cowboy by H Kate Hunt. Um, this is a reminder that you can go to the Chiseled and Curvy series, and there are 10 books in that. They all have the different ones, all the, all the different things that are read out. Go check those out on Amazon. Um, they're all in Kindle Unlimited, too, so make sure you grab those. Um, you're just going to have such a fun time going down her backlist. She literally has a one billion books so, like I know she said a hundred but there's got to be more than that there's a ton on there so if you like what you listen to today you're gonna love everything that she writes sweet steamy and so love like dirty spicy all the good things so make sure you check that out um yeah so thank you again so much for Kate Hunt for being on the podcast with us we really appreciate it um thank you for bringing us Destin to the Billionaire Cowboy um, as a reminder, we have book boxes. So if you want to help support the podcast, that's a great way to do it. 100% of your purchase, every single dollar from your purchase goes back into funding future audiobooks on the podcast. So we really appreciate your support, um, to help us continue this podcast. Um, next week we have Amelia Wild. She's brought us a book called Safe Word. Hmm. I like that. And if you're hearing this in time, please send me an email at readmeromance at gmail.com. You can tell me what is your safe word and why. Because I'm always super curious about what people's safe words are. I just think it's kind of a fun little quiz. So I've always I've heard the joke recently about like, oh my meat word my what is it? My um safe word is meatloaf because I'd do anything for love, but I won't do that. Da dum <laughs> this is why they don't leave me alone, guys. I'm sorry. So, you know, it, it, it is what it is today, okay? I did my best. <laughs> um, Join me back next week. Uh, I think that's everything. Fuck your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. You could take a look in a book, that's fine. Or you could sit back,